you know, 99U is sort of a part of phase one of my, my career, which was really around helping organize and empower the creative world to make ideas happen. That was kind of the idea back in 2005 uh, behind Behance. And, um, and as some of you know, we started as a paper products company and uh, trying to help teams be more organized and, and productive you know, in their creative process. And that evolved into a book after interviewing a lot of the most productive creative teams in the world. And, uh, and of course, 99U and all of you beautiful people, um, this community and Behance as a network really made us into a technology company in some ways where we were building portfolio uh, site tools for you know, millions of creatives uh, to showcase their work and, and get discovered and get the attribution for their work that they deserve. And so I would say that from this first stage um, of my journey, as I think back to like um, one of the things I've really learned about product, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today and what I was asked to uh, think about for this presentation, is just that these days you can have a... Uh, you can be a mission-centric and medium-agnostic business, you know, or, or, or person or team. I mean, you really uh, don't have to define yourselves anymore as a paper products company or a conference or a technology company, uh, especially with all of these kind of SaaS services and billing and location, all these other things that are now just a few lines of code or $12 a month. Um, you can actually really think about your mission more than anything else and be medium-agnostic in how you accomplish it. So then I was thinking about phase two um, of my career, which started in uh, late 2012. We became part of this Adobe family, and, uh, and I realized, okay, I have a few years now um, to, uh, to continue working with my team, but what can I do to challenge myself uh, to learn more and make more of an impact now in a larger company and, and serving a larger number of people around the world. And, uh, and so Creative Cloud at the time was this way of getting all of your desktop tools like Photoshop and Illustrator and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then in the mobile apps were kind of, kind of you know, a, a collection of apps that didn't connect to the desktop software, didn't connect to each other, really had no role in like, the professional creative process. And so that was one of those challenges I raised up my hand and said, I'd love to tackle this. And so over the years, I worked with a number of people, including some that are here, building a whole suite you know, of, um, of, of mobile products uh, that actually connect with the desktop tools and can be part of a real professional creative process. And I think over that period of, of three years, if I think about the product philosophy I took away from that experience, it's really that... Um, it's really the challenge about making products you know, powerful enough for professionals or for your power users, um, and, uh, but accessible to everyone. And I think, by the way, like, let me just quickly ask, like, who's building some form of digital product right now? So a lot of people, but even if you're not, even if you're building an experience or some other product, you know, it's, it's, always, um, it's always tempting to focus on the folks that love it the most and sometimes uh, fail, you fail to make it accessible to everyone. And so that was one of those challenges um, at Adobe that we, uh, we, we, we reconciled. Phase three, which I think I'm still in right now, is, um, is, is supporting mission-driven teams that want to change something or lead something worth changing. And uh, this started as uh, working with some other entrepreneurs I knew when they were starting their companies and learning about the, um, you know, the, early, the early product experience that they were trying to develop and trying to solve a lot of the problems as they found product market fit. Um, I mean, one of those examples is Periscope, you know, which is a team that I met when they were still doing drop a pin and get a photo, you know, and thinking about how this could be a live video network and what that might look like. Um, and, uh, and then now I'm working with a team in New York uh, and San Francisco called Prefer, which is a way to, for you to kind of see all the service professionals your friends use. Um, and so with, with these teams, uh, now again, like in the, in the beginning and mostly in the beginning stages of their journey, what I've become really fascinated with and a real product philosophy for me has been to make sure that this first mile of the customer's experience is not neglected. It's the ultimate irony, I think, especially for those of us that are building digital products, that oftentimes the last mile of our experience building the product is spent on the first mile of the customer's experience using our product. And if you think about how crazy that is, because everyone talks about getting people through the funnel, you know, someone signs up or checks out a website or whatever, and it's all about getting them to actually figure out what they need your product for and to get into it and sign up and whatever, that first mile is sort of oftentimes an afterthought, you know, when we're putting together the tour and the splash pages and whatever before lunch. And in fact, that may be the most important thing. So, so this is the question you know, that I was uh, asked to think about today, which is um, you know, what, what must we do to keep our products accessible? Because at the end of the day, you know, that's, that, that's how we reach our full potential, our product's full potential, and make the greatest impact. And I think to start thinking about this, we have to actually start by understanding the journey that many of us are actually in right now. I mean, this is kind of the myth of making, which is 
you have this incredible, you know, energetic moment with a team or whatever, and Rick had a number of them that he shared, where it's like, okay, awesome, let's do this. And then, um, and then you have a lot of work and then gradually, you know, reach to this point of accomplishment. Um, but actually, I think it's more of a myth. Um, the reality looks probably a little bit more like this, <laughs> where, you know, it's like, okay, awesome, you know, let's do this. And then you kind of get into this like crazy, crazy period where you have these incessant kind of moments of, oh, like shit, this is not gonna work. Oh, a little bit of recovery and it kind of goes up and down and up and down. And I think that, um, I think that really, you know, surviving this and somehow getting a, a positive slope, you know, is maybe the best you can possibly do. Uh, but when you're in this, think about the implications of it. You know, in the beginning of this, you think you have a plan, right? And then you realize, oh shit, I actually can't really plan. This is just not going as I expected. Um, I like to always tell teams that a labor of love tends to pay off just never as you expect. And this is why. Uh, in the beginning, you're so self-reliant. You're like, I can do this by myself, and maybe I need this other person to do this, and this other person to do this. And you realize, wait a second, this is actually entirely about my team. And, uh, and it's like a very humbling, I think, realization as shit gets real uh, that you uh, start to focus on that. And then, very relevant to today, to today is that um, a lot of great products are, are, are launched because uh, this, you can have a lot of simplicity and insight in the beginning. When you have that awesome, let's do this phase, you know exactly what you wanna do and you're not distracted by all the realities. And then, of course, over the course of the journey, every time you have one of those bumps, you tend to solve it by adding complexity. And I think this is why so many products become inaccessible to so many people. And so how do we defy the whims of this journey? Uh, I think the best thing we can possibly do is to ground all the product decisions we make as we're designing with consistent convictions, a few consistent convictions that you always come back to and try to you know, see through all of the noise. For me, one of those simple convictions is this reality that life is basically just time and how you use it. And so bear with me here. I would argue that the majority of products we use either spend your time or save time. Now, there are some that clearly spend time, like just news and games and, you know, and, and, and reading and Facebook and social media. These are just, these are products that actually measure their performance on how much time of yours they are taking. So they are all about spending your time. Then there are products that we use to save time, you know, whether it's to get from A to B more quickly, to remember something more quickly, um, to get something delivered so you don't have to go out and do it yourself, to communicate um, more efficiently. You know, these are arguably products that help you save time. And then there are uh, uh, some companies that, I don't know, like they kind of help us save time and spend time. I mean, Blue Apron is getting us to cook, so it's spending our time cooking rather than going to, you know, getting delivery, but it's also cutting up our vegetables or preparing the food for us in some ways, so it's saving time in doing that. And I think Twitter, you know, the headlines kind of oftentimes save you from actually having to read the articles and stuff, so maybe it saves time, but it probably actually spends time, um, at least for me. But uh, in, this, if, in this, this context, it's as if we're fighting to save time and are being seduced to spend time at all times. And that's kind of life. Uh, and uh, I think that the only exception to this is when our natural human tendencies kick in. Um, what are these natural human tendencies? These are just things that are like basic and primal and instinctual, like I always wanna accomplish more with minimal effort. They're just like a default that we have about avoiding difficult decisions, wanting to be recognized, um, preserving options. We love optionality. Um, we don't wanna get pigeonholed. We all wanna look good. You know, these are some of these natural human tendencies that we will behave out of despite the time implications. In some ways you could argue that our natural human tendencies are the twilight zone for time. And while we are, they're so native to us, they are sometimes unknown to us when we're designing products and building them for others. And, uh, and so it's worth thinking about uh, some of these human tendencies and realizing that if we can accommodate them um, in products that we are making, we can actually engage in routine you know, customers. So, so with that, I thought, okay, so what are, big, what are major human tendencies that, 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 are, that are relevant here? And I would say the first one is that in the first 15 seconds of every experience uh, with any sort of new product, we are lazy, we are vain, and we are selfish. Let me explain. And of course, I should just say that once we get deeply engaged with something, it becomes more than that to us, right? But in the initial, initial experience, we're all lazy, vain, and selfish. We're lazy in the sense that we don't have time to read or learn something new. 
you know, these bad onboardings that we've all seen where it's like too many examples or videos that we have to watch or all this copy that we just can't, can't bear to read. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, as, as, as people that make products, we try to oftentimes show something rather than explain it. So rather than watch a video or read something and instructions, we're going to kind of show you maybe with tool tips or that sort of thing. But even better than that, if we just do it for the user, for the customer, you know, doing is even better. And that's you know, through things like templates and um, smart selections versus having to have manual entries, presumptuous defaults. And one of my, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from a friend, Dave Marin, who you know, always likes to say, the devil's in the defaults. Whatever you present to the person you're designing for, like, they will most often just take that. And so don't make that decision uh, without enough thought. We're lazy, we're vain. We're vain in the sense that whatever this random thing is that got me on Facebook or, or, or a friend told me about or whatever, like this better make me look good and quickly because I don't have a lot of time, right? And so um, in order to think about that reality, that human tendency, I always like to come back to this notion of ego analytics. And I always talk about this with teams. Like what are you doing to show your users, especially in the early stages of their experience, that this is kind of making them look good? And um, you know, a Periscope example, uh, one of the things we realized early on with Periscope is that um, broadcasts are kind of boring. And, uh, and also, the broadcaster is always kind of wondering, are people watching this? We have two random people watching this. This feels kind of dead to me. I don't know if, you know, I don't know if this is making me look good. And so the incessant heart um, uh, UI that was put in there actually um, really helped retain you know, the experience and made people feel like they were, even if it was one or two people watching, but you got a stream of hearts. It gave you this sense of, oh, this is making me look good. I can actually engage with this longer to have a deeper experience with the product. I mean, Instagram, I mean, what a great example. You know, when you, uh, when you are going to Instagram, you're always like pinged with how many people liked your stuff. And what's really interesting is that when you, um, when, you, when you post something new in social media, your uh, likelihood to go back to that product goes up tremendously for some period of time after you added content. And then it goes back down again. And so the whole idea of a lot of these content sharing products is that we're using them to see what our friends are discovering, to see our friends' experiences, to see great design and whatever. When in fact, I think the dirty little secret here is that social consumer products are as much about seeing who saw your content as they are about seeing and sharing other people's content. And so that ego analytics actually really drives, especially initially, the engagement you need to get people in and, and, and to have them you know, mine it for more value. And then in the first 15 seconds, I think everyone's selfish. You know, we need to benefit quickly from something, spending any time on this. Everyone has family and work and all these other things um, and all these other products that are trying to spend their time. And so we're all appropriately so, I think, very selfish with like the expectations, you know, when we start to use something new. Um, we're very skeptical of long-term promises. They're not enough to keep us engaged. The product really needs to deliver value to you now. And if you think about some examples, I mean, over the years, uh, Pinterest, really did start with this big vision of being a discovery network. But um, Ben and his team, when they were just getting started, it was really all about making a personal collection for you. You know, they realized that that vision of discovery of other people's stuff or whatever, it just wouldn't, it wasn't appealing like to the selfish need of the user when they first signed up back then, which was, I want a collection of stuff. I mean, they were basically competing with Delicious at the time, other bookmarking services that weren't visual. And that was sort of their initial value proposition um, to offer this immediate utility and don't rely on this like long-term vision. Let it, let it happen over time. I mean, Slack. I remember you know, our team at Behance used HipChat for years. And then someone installed Slack. And it became like a way to share kind of fun gifts and jokes and whatever. And, uh, and that, you know, that, no that novelty preceded utility. It's as if like, Slack's initial value proposition was fun. Um, and then once you got the use of it, then you started to realize that there was like a sort of network effect utility in your team as well. So sometimes you can lead through that selfishness by just having a fun aspect of your product or service. Um, and then there are these products like these developer tools where the, the value proposition, or, or sorry, uh, in this case, it's a payment tool, is um, you know, get paid faster. It's just like immediate selfish value proposition or um, two lines of code. 
you know, for, for Stripe, which is really appealing to um, the uh, a developer's desire to just like get something done quickly and not waste any time. And so this all begs the question, why are different teams always responsible for marketing and copy and product? I mean, if these things that we just talked about are so core to the end-to-end -end product experience, maybe marketing and copy should actually be born by the product team. You know, it's part of the product experience. And I think so few teams actually realize that. But especially in that first mile of the customer's experience, it's absolutely crucial. So second human tendency here is we don't want to make the wrong choice. And in fact, it turns out, obviously, you know, if we have too many choices, we even get more scared of making the wrong choice. And uh, I would argue that you know, the more options we've got, the more problems we've got. And I think this is true for all of us and for the products we create um, for our customers. This is why I think this, you know, the whole product life cycle of especially every digital product um, is, is, is quite simple, right? You know, users flock to a simple product. This new messaging system comes out, this new tool for payments, this new whatever, this new social media tool. Users love the simplicity. And then that product starts to take its users for granted, starts to really focus on those power users, and really starts to think about their strategy and the business model, and they start to just kind of layer in complication, complication, especially as that journey becomes more difficult. And then what happens? Users flock to simple product. And this is kind of that product life cycle that happens over and over. And I see so many pitches from teams that are basically, they don't say this, but I'm looking at their deck and I'm thinking, oh, so they're basically taking Twitter or whatever it is, and they're just simplifying it again. And that is their product plan. And the funny thing is, it's not a bad one, because um, this is actually how customers behave. So it's super hard to make something simple. Um, and back to that graphic we saw in the beginning, but that graphic also made it very clear that it's especially hard to really stay um, simple and, uh, and to make sure that we you know, keep grounding those decisions we're making in, in, with the right convictions. Um, I think the trick here is to continue to prioritize problems for new users over problems for power users. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that we tend to make is that when you have that first mile experience down for new users, to assume that that's actually gonna work forever because actually different cohorts of new users happen over time. The people who use a product three years later or five years later for the first time are more pragmatists oftentimes than the visionaries who adopted it early on. And I think great examples like Twitter and others where their onboarding had to completely change to reach beyond like that sort of cap of their potential uh, customer or user market. And so maybe we need to spend and preserve 50% you know, of our focus consistently on the new user's experience you know, rather than pushing and kicking it to the end or having it some, be something we actually always just come back to randomly to preserve that focus um, is something to think about. So the third human tendency here is that I've been thinking a lot about these days is that we have this natural tendency to long for the good old days, especially as technology makes everything around us you know, more efficient and more automated. Um, we, you know, we, yes, there's all these notifications and things that we get telling us what to do and whatever, and, and we, we use these devices, we use these services, and yet we kind of just long for just having what we need when we need it. We love the idea of automation and things happening more efficiently, and yet we long to work with people and build relationships. We want access to everything out there at our fingertips, and yet we kind of long for just knowing what the best thing is and not worrying about everything else. And so amidst our desire for like faster and better and cheaper, there is this unique human tendency to just have a soft spot for a small town life. Like the, everyone talks about, you know, when they go to Vermont and how nice it was and why don't I just live there? You know, there's something about this small town life that we long for. Um, I've been thinking a lot about it because as these online marketplaces um, evolve and become you know, disintermediate industries and have a part of our everyday life, if you look at the underlying mechanics of these marketplaces that we use, they're all around getting the best price, you know, proximity, the closest delivery person, the closest driver, the closest this, the closest that, or ratings, you know, 3.5 stars on Yelp or whatever else. Um, whereas in small town life, it's everything's driven by different forces. It's driven by trust, you know, who your, relation, who your neighbor says you should use or relationships, it's referrals, right? And so, you know, I, I think about all these different companies that have evolved, you know, around these traditional, these new, you know, very rational desires for a marketplace, you know, to have a faster, better, cheaper experience. 
But word of mouth is oftentimes how new relationships spawn. And, uh, and, you know, and that's something that I'm also thinking about with this new team I mentioned to prefer is how can you capitalize on trust, relationships, referrals, that sort of thing. Um, why is it that we would take one trusted referral from a friend over a million anonymous reviews? You know, even if I don't know you, if I tell you there's this amazing Italian restaurant in the West Village that you absolutely must go to, you might actually listen to me despite whatever Yelp says. Um, it's not really rational. Uh, because of the, all the science and math, yet we still have this like longing to just kind of trust a person. So I think that's the insight, is that we're more likely to rely on relationships and trust, even though we want efficiency and savings and speed and that sort of stuff. Maybe natural, you know, actually is more powerful than rational. And so as we try to design and build products and start businesses that are all based on this rational sense of how people should you know, want to behave, Sometimes we have to tap into those natural tendencies of how they really behave and always try to go with the natural grain. So if you're thinking about a new product or service, you know, question, you know, does this go against or with kind of what people would do naturally, I think is a great way of capturing the benefits of human tendencies rather than fighting them. The fourth tendency I've been thinking a lot of these days about is, um, is that we favor novelty, um, yet we cling to familiarity. Um, it's, a, it's this natural tendency where uh, I think it comes from this, the, the notion of the lizard brain, which was actually first introduced to me when Seth Godin spoke at our conference maybe eight years ago. He talked about this ancestral part of our brain that uh, makes us uh, very comfortable with familiarity, but really run away and recoil from anything that is new. And, uh, and even if we know that new thing is, is interesting or good for us, we still tend to trend towards what is actually, you know, what is familiar and innate. I think back to an example in Behance, we launched this network for creative professionals around the world in 2006 and 2007. And what did we call the fields that all of you are in? We called them realms, because we thought that was more unique. And so we called them creative realms. And uh, my co-founder, Matthias, who is here, whenever we would talk about it, he would always say like realms. And I was like, if, you're, if your co-founder can't pronounce the language you're using, <laughs> it's probably a sign that you shouldn't be using it. We also called the, um, the groups of people that assembled in behind circles, well before Google used that term. Uh, and people didn't know what the heck we were talking about. It's like, I join a circle and I'm in a realm? Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and it kind of took some years of being like, all right, you know, let's not try to be innovative here. Let's just be very familiar. Let's just call them fields and groups, creative fields and groups. And of course, usage went up as a result of that decision. Familiarity is the friend of utilization, right? When you're familiar with something, you utilize it more readily. I looked around my apartment before coming here, and you know, I, I noticed that you know, like my control, my, my, my music control, you know, has this button on it called party. You know? And it's like such a familiar notion. Now, it could have all these like, bells and whistles for like, a different room and all this other stuff, but no, party just you know, puts it all on. Um, uh, a bit more on my toaster. You know, it's such, like a, it's such a familiar notion, you know, and, and, uh, and it, it's, it's, very, it's very effective. Um, so while familiarity, familiarity is the friend of utilization, I would also argue that it is the enemy of innovation. And any of us who have ever held or hosted a focus group know all too well that what you're essentially doing in a focus group is you are testing what is familiar. Um, and by doing so, you will stay safe, but it will prevent you from innovating. Because naturally, just like, like based on people's lizard brains, right? When you show them something that they don't recognize, and they will recoil to what is familiar, and you'll end up always regressing to the mean. And so, um, so then that begs the question: like, when should we be doing what is familiar, and when should we try and be trying to push the line and innovate? Because I'm not suggesting that we all just basically, you know, go with what's familiar to breed utilization. We should adopt familiar patterns, though, whenever possible. We should use creative fields and groups, right, when they're readily available and they just explicitly say what we're trying to accomplish. But we should force a new behavior when it powers a unique value in our product and service, something that we think you know, will make the big difference, will make the impact. I mean, an example from the Periscope experience was when the team was launching their product, it was at a time when like, all the new apps were selfie apps video selfies and photo selfies. And every app opened with the default facing you, 
because selfie was like the whole thing. Like it was on, you know, the morning shows were always talking about selfies, like selfie was even probably bigger than it is now because it just went crazy at that time. And so when Periscope came out, a lot of the initial feedback in our beta was, um, wait, you know, why, why, is the, why is the defaults wrong? Like it should be me. Like everyone wants to always show themselves when they broadcast, not something else. And the team was like, no, 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 no. Like our vision is, is really about teleporting and seeing the world through someone else's eyes. And so while that might throw people off at first, that's like one of those new behaviors we're trying to force because it actually defines what makes this product different than all of these other selfie apps that people are downloading. And so that's just one example. I really think that transformational products are 90% accommodating of what's familiar and 10% retraining. And so whatever you're doing, you know, find the thing, find the, the unique value for which you need a new behavior that needs to be forced upon the user and then try to be familiar in everything else that you do in order to breed utilization. So what must we do to keep our products accessible? You know, we need to have faith in our customers, but not in the first 15 seconds. You know, in the first 15 seconds, we need to remember that they are, in fact, lazy, vain, and selfish, and we have to meet them where they are to get them through. We have to stay grounded by the newest customer's experience and not succumb to making our power users or our, our greatest customers always more happy at the expense of always optimizing that first mile. We need to favor a lot of the natural forces over what we think is rational, because natural is very, very powerful in how people use products. And, um, and remember, like, innovation is great, you know, so long as the core mechanics and the language that you are using um, is familiar. These human tendencies you know, that we just discussed you know, they defy our ideals for our products. We really always conceive this broad vision of what people will ultimately discover about themselves or accomplish or use and what it will become. But we have to be you know, grounded and kind of humbled by the fact that these natural human tendencies actually prevail and, and are more powerful even than our ideals. Um, you're creating for people. And as a result, just as you're doing that, be as human as you possibly can. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.